This is inspiration, a thousand people here, book lovers, and a wonderful program. So welcome to the in inspiration stage at the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Mark Sweeney, the Principal Deputy Librarian of Congress. The festival's theme, everyone has a story, celebrates the story in all of us. It's especially relevant to this stage, which begins with a road novel and ends with this year's Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction winner. In between, you'll learn about nature poetry and found families, discover how horror helps us understand real world problems, understand the costs of poverty, and how the discovery of cells helped revolutionize science. In other words, you'll experience the vibrant range of knowledge and creativity today's writers offer. The work that the Library of Congress supports, collects, and celebrates. And welcome to everyone who's joining us online. We're glad you're with us today. I want to give a special thanks to this year's James Madison Council at the Library of Congress, which is supporting this stage. The Madison Council is comprised of public-minded philanthropists who advance the library's effort to make our vast collections more accessible and dynamic. As visionaries, champions, and ambassadors, the Madison Council is a truly a crown jewel of our national library. Our first event, On the Lincoln Highway, Historical Fiction with Amor Tolls, features the beloved writer in conversation with Crosby Kemper, the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is a charter sponsor of the festival. Please join me in welcoming both, and I wish you all a wonderful day at the Library of Congress National Book Festival. Thank you. Morning. Thank you for coming. So uh, we thought, since this is the inspiration stage, that Amor would give you some inspirational words to start things off. I, <laughs> um, I did. I did want to open with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, uh, Crosby and I are going to have a conversation. We we hope to have time for questions from the audience as well. Uh, if we don't cover your question today. You can always go to amortolls.com, and if you go to the contact page, your questions and comments come right to me. Now, that's an amazing thing about the modern era, that that's possible. It has its drawbacks. <laughs> so to give you sort of a flavor, you know, some of the comments that come in are helpful, some are not so helpful. I want to give you a flavor for that. I wanted to you know, share with you some examples of some of the outreach that I get. Now, uh, in, importantly, uh, at this stage, when a novel of mine comes out, like The Lincoln Highway, usually it takes about a week for the corrections to start rolling in. Uh, so, to give you a sense of that, you know, here's an example. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I received this about 10 days after the book came out. Dear Mr. Tolls, you start too many sentences with ing words. <laughs> now that's not very helpful. But the best part about this email is how it ends. Looking. <laughs> looking forward to your next book. <laughs> so here's one I like. Uh, so in the Lincoln Highway, uh, late in the novel, Emmett and his friends are sort of gathered in a fancy home in New York uh, for a fancy dinner. Things go awry. So late at night, uh, Emmett is alone in the kitchen, uh, cleaning up sort of as an act of penance. And uh, this is the email that I received from uh, Karen of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Karen writes, on page 477, you describe how Emmett was doing the dishes, saying that Emmett first washed the plates, then the crystal, then the pots. As the winner of the 1973 Betty Crocker Future Homemaker Award, <laughs> at my high school, 
I can tell you with some authority that the proper way to wash dishes is first the crystal, <laughs> then the plates, and finally the pots. Thank you, Karen from Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's a favorite. Um, so earlier in the novel, uh, Duchess and Wooly borrow Emmett's car, and they're driving east on the Lincoln Highway uh, through Iowa, and when they, they get to Ames, it's early in the morning, they're just outside of Ames, Iowa, and they run out of gas. So Duchess gets out of the car, and he's looking up and down the road, and in the near distance he sees a liquor store, and he thinks, okay, at this hour it's probably closed. If I break in, I may find some money in the till, uh, failing that, I could at least take some bodies of, uh, bottles of whiskey and give them to a gas station attendant in exchange for gas. This is Duchess's plan. And so here is the email I received from uh, Jane of Pequot Lake, Minnesota. There were no liquor stores in Ames, Iowa in 1954. <laughs> Hard liquor and wine could only be purchased at the county seat. This meant that my parents, who were heavy drinkers, <laughs> had to drive all the way to Boone. Every week, my mother and I would drive to Boone to buy a case of Gallo wine, some Gallo vermouth, and a no-name bourbon. When you paid, the clerk would produce a large ledger where you had to write down your purchases and sign it. Now, the best part of this email is the P.S. P.S. I lived across the street from Miss Evans, my fourth grade teacher. She told my mom that Mr. Harlan, our principal, would review the liquor store log every week to see how much and what his teachers were drinking. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Lincoln Highway has been out for about a year and three quarters, so we've, we're wrapping up the corrections phase, everybody. But if you want to let me know about your parents' drinking habits, you are welcome to do so. All right, well, thank you. Let's get started. Thank you. Thank you. So, Amor, this, this was something I was going to ask you about later on, but it, it does strike me that it's appropriate after reading, uh, you're reading the corrections. And, and uh, uh, there, there's a lot about WASP culture, maybe even a particularly Episcopalian wasp culture uh, in your books, particularly the rules of civility and, and the, the, the Lincoln Highway. And, you know, the proper way to mix a cocktail does, you know, make an appearance. And, and the, the way you ornament uh, the rooms uh, and grand in the character and uh, uh, in the rules of civility and the, the decoration of the Adirondack house that uh, is a destination in the, in the book. Um, is WASP culture a, a target of yours? Is, is it a background of yours? Is it, is it, do you see it as a, 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 a subject of your, of your books? Uh, it's interesting. I, 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 so for those of you, for, for the one person out there who doesn't know, WASP stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, which is sort of a, a uh, a tradition going back in, I grew up in New England, and so I do come from WASP, uh, WASP background, as it were. So I suppose, yes, I am interested in that culture and how it operates, but I'm really interested in, in all the various uh, threads of American life. You know, I think that for many novelists, that's the case. I'm interested in how, uh, for instance, in the case of the Lincoln Highway, in thinking about the book and designing the book, uh, you have the main hero, Emmett, who is you know, raised in the Midwest on a farm. Uh, you then have his two friends from New York who have hidden in the trunk of the warden's car and who then suddenly appear uh, at, at Emmett's farm the day that he's released uh, from the juvenile prison. And those two characters, while both coming from Manhattan, come from very different parts of Manhattan. You know, one comes from uh, sort of the Upper East Side, a wealthier background, uh, a cultured background. He is a wasp with a long sort of family heritage. And then you have a uh, duchess who comes from a tougher part of town, from the Lower East Side, raised by a father who was a drinker and a bit of a con man and uh, surrounded by performers, drinkers, and con men in his youth. And so 
part of the nature of the Lincoln Highway is an examination of how these different upbringings change uh, who the shape who these individuals are. You know, these people who are all born basically within you know, 12 months of each other uh, and have been raised sort of side, not side by side, but have been raised through the same era, yet are very different people. And an aspect of that is their personalities, of course, but a part of that certainly is their upbringing and the regions from which they come and, and the way they've, they've been raised. And I'll, sort of the last sort of thing I'll say about this, because I, I think it's a good example, is I, I was in, speaking in London and trying to give them a flavor for this difference. And uh, because it doesn't, they're not as, as aware of some of these differences that, that most American readers might be. And so to make it clear, my point was that if you look at Emmett, he's raised in this Midwestern tradition. And one aspect of the Midwestern tradition, particularly on the plains, the prairies, uh, that those families who uh, moved out to the plains in the mid 19th century and began to establish uh, those communities, that was hard living. You know, these are. Uh, empty land, you're trying to build farms, you had hard winters, uh, there were no uh, services anywhere near you, you might be uh, a mile from your first, your neighbor, you might be five miles uh, from town uh, when you were sort of building your farm. And now what that meant was, is that in the Midwest, in that region, uh, you had to have a very good relationship with your neighbor. Because uh, your neighbor may be someone that you, you, would, you would rely on, uh, and your life or a member of your family's life may depend upon you having a good relationship with your neighbor in a, a moment of crisis. So there is this tradition in the Midwest of sort of this neighborliness, which is very thoughtful and has been handed down over the generations, and you can see it in a character like Emmett. Now, that's very different from if you were raised in New York City at the same time, whether in the mid-19th century, the early 20th century, where everybody's packed in, there's immigrants from all around the world, you know, sort of, uh, uh, there's a lot of poverty, uh, there's risk of crime, you're living in tenement houses. Now in that environment, uh, your life may depend upon distrusting your neighbor, right? When there's a knock on the door at night, you don't open it immediately and say, who's there, right? You'd say, who is it? Why are you here? What are you doing? And so that's a very different kind of upbringing, and, and so, for me, yes, I am very interested in the intricacy of WASP culture and the sort of the way in which it has ethics and the way those are handed down, the way they, uh, the shortcomings and advantages of being a, a part of a culture like that, but I'm equally interested in these other ones. What are the advantages and disadvantages of being raised in a religious family in the Midwest? What are the advantages and disadvantages of being raised in a rough and tumble family on the Lower East Side? It, it, it does seem to me that rules play a big role in the characters' lives, whether, whether they're WASP rules or other kind of rules. So Emmett has his own sense of paying debt, of paying his debts off, also uh, the rules around his ownership, his car, for instance. Yes. Duchess also has a sense of repaying debts. There's a great scene where he, he asks to be hit, yes. he asks to be beaten up by townhouse, who has his own set of rules. That's right. Uh, who's a, you know, essentially a, a sort of gang leader uh, in, uh, in New York. Uh, so it, r rules are, are, are something that everyone has to live by their own rules in yes. your books. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And that is a, that's a sort of an extension of that first part of our conversation and, and a central theme of the Lincoln Highway. And I, I, if you look at it, I think the, a, way, a way of thinking about this topic uh, a lens, an important one in the case of the book, is through the lens of what it means to be 18. You know, I think if you look back over history, anywhere in the world, at any time basically, uh, the moment between, sometime between the age of 16 and 19, let's say, uh, is this universal moment of awakening. Because wherever you're from, between the age of zero and 16, uh, you are being raised, you know, and as a result, you are constantly being told what to do and how the world works by your parents, by the church, by schools, by your community at large. That's the nature of being raised as a young person. And for the most part, as young people, we receive all of that input pretty passively. I mean, we assume, we take it at face value, we assume it's correct. Uh, and now the reason that our parents and the church and the schools are shaping us, uh, are telling us these things when we're young is to shape us. They're trying to give us a sense of 
how the world works and uh, what we should expect of others, what we should demand of ourselves, and ultimately what is right and wrong. This is all being communicated to us on an ongoing basis. Now, sometime around 16, 17, 18, 19, we all have this moment of recognition where we say, you know, actually all these things have been, I've been told, I don't have to accept any of it, right? I, I, it may or may not be true. And in fact, I have both uh, the liberty and the responsibility to make decisions about all those things myself. You know, I can decide what America means. I can decide how to uh, can, you know, think about my involvement in religion. I can, uh, think of, I can ultimately decide what I'm capable of, uh, who I want to spend my time with, with. And very importantly, I can decide what is right and wrong. And so this is a very central part of this novel. Because uh, as you pointed out, yes, you do have Willie and Duchess and Emmett, but you have Sally and you have Townhouse. And they're all around 18 years old. They're all going through this transition where they're beginning to look back and deciding what have I been told, what have I been handed down that I want to keep uh, consciously or unconsciously? What do I want to reject consciously or unconsciously that I've been told? And how do I begin to start to shape my own sense of the world and very importantly around these topics of what is right and wrong? So it's interesting. I think it's uh, Katie and the Rules of Civility who says, uh, you, you discover, you, you, you create a world around yourself by discovering who shares your sense of right and wrong. And, and, and in Lincoln Highway, one of, the, one of the things that seems true is that there's this sort of faded uh, clash of the sense of right and wrong that Duchess ultimately, and Willie to some extent, don't have the same, and Willie's lost what he thought was right in the world, I think might be one way of describing it. And Duchess has a very different sense of right and wrong than, say, Emmett and Sally and Billy. Yes, Fair enough. Okay. correct. <laughs> Glad we got that question answered. Uh, and so, but, but you know, the interesting thing is you describe the book, it could be described as, a, you know, it's a growing, growing up story. It's people learning about themselves and learning about right and wrong, learning about the world, the buildings roam on, whatever you want to call it, a road novel. Uh, et cetera. But the one person who always seems centered and seems to know everything he needs to know about the world, even though he is continually discovering and measuring the, what the world does against what he knows, is Billy. Yes. The youngest, uh, who, who's, who's learned a lot of this obviously from reading, particularly reading a particular, a particular book by a particular author whom they go to, go to visit. And it, so the, the character of Billy, is, does Billy represent you? Oh, no. Oh, my God. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I wish in many ways, but no, I, I wasn't really a, a like a Billy. I, 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 I love the, the character Billy. Uh, Billy is Emmett's younger brother. Emmett is 18. Their father has died. Their mother is long gone. And, but he has an eight-year-old brother who he, he, cares, who he cares for. And, uh, and so I think in, in imagining the book, and let, let me take a quick step back, because I think this would be instructive. And that's to give you a flavor for how I work. Uh, usually I start with a very simple notion. So in, in a book for me, I've been writing since I was a kid. I wrote fiction in high school and college and graduate school. Um, and throughout my life, I'll have ideas for stories. Uh, like, you know, guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> you know. So when I have a notion like that, I'm like, yeah, that could be a book. That's interesting. It's you, you, usually, it comes very quickly with, I can see aspects of it very quickly. So, and I mean like in a matter of minutes. So in that case, within a matter of minutes, I was like, oh yeah, it could be uh, set in Russia. He could be an aristocrat, sentenced to house arrest in a fancy hotel across the street from the Kremlin, and the story could span uh, from the revolution to the Cold War. Like, all that I knew within a matter of minutes. Uh, in the case of Lincoln Highway, similarly, I had this idea of two kids hidden in the trunk of the warden's car when the warden drives a young, honorable young man home to... And as soon as I had that idea, I thought, oh, great. It could be in the 50s. Uh, the, the, you know, he could be uh, going to a home to a farm that's in bankruptcy in the Midwest. They could be from New York, but from different parts of the city. Uh, the whole story could be 10 days. You know, that, that comes very quickly. Now... Once I have that sense of it, then what will happen is I'll just start to dwell on it. And, and this, the dwelling process, which I kind of call design, it'll last a couple of years. 
So I'll spend a couple of years imagining the story in every detail. I'll imagine everything that happens, the settings, the people and their backgrounds, slowly getting a more intricate and bigger picture of what the novel will be in its entirety. And only when I really know the book from beginning to end do I then, what I consider, starting to write chapter one. So I have this long design process. Now, in that process, going back to Billy, I start with these three boys. You have the kid who's returning to the farm, you have the two kids in the trunk, they're all 18, they've all just done some time uh, in, in a juvenile prison, is then you start to imagine who else is in this story. And for whatever reason, immediately I was like, oh yeah, Emmett's gonna have a younger brother. And you know, for any, I think, writer, uh, any storyteller, there's a little bit of uh, sort of subconscious dynamic where as you're populating a story with either events or people or spaces, there's this sort of unspoken, unconscious sense of balance that you're constantly uh, trying to create, trying to create oppositions and balances that will bring the story to life. So it felt very natural that this sibling would be eight years old. And I didn't think about that too much. But in retrospect, I think the reason I wanted to have this eight-year-old is because of, as an opposition to what we were talking about a minute ago. This dynamic of being 18 that I went on at some length about, this, this fashioning of the self, becoming an adult, making decisions for yourself, defining the world on your own, regardless of what you've been told. That's such a center point of the story that it's nice to have this counterpoint, which is that a sibling who's still only eight, where none of that is on the table, where you have instead sort of that dynamic of the youth, of youth which is very wide-eyed and, uh, and open and you know, assumes sort of the best in people, has not been jaded, has not become suspicious, um, is you know, full of wonder. And it just felt right that that's gonna be a part of the story too, is that if we're gonna have an opposition, two siblings, it should be almost those two parts of our lives you know, being put side by side. And I do think that uh, one of the nice things about that when you meet siblings who are, say, 10 years apart, is you can see how uh, the 18-year-old is sort of maybe raising the 8-year-old, but the 8-year-old is having great effect on the 18-year-old at the same time, reminding the 18-year-old of kind of, of sort of this innocent, wide-eyed, honest viewpoint that a child can have. Um, and and, so that, and that, view, but that viewpoint, actually, the, the, the wild-eyed wonder, and you talk, wonder, wonder is a, a really important uh, ingredient, I think, in, in your books. You, you have magicians wandering uh, uh, through, the, through the book, and, and the, the, they're, they're wonderful stories and stories about wonder, the wonder that, that magic can do. But, but Billy actually controls the, 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 the motion of the, of the story. Yes. He convinces his brother, and his brother goes through this elaborate uh, analysis of Texas versus California, the population growth, et cetera. But uh, Billy nonetheless con convinces him uh, to, to, uh, to go to California on the Lincoln Highway, which of course they never get to. But um, B Billy, Billy's a kind of Vatic character in, yeah. in the novel. Because he, I mean, for those of you who read it, you know, he, he uh, part of the, the, the aspect of the story is that while he's very sort of quiet, thoughtful, you know, kid, uh, he has sort of an outsized impact on those he meets. So not only on Emmett, but on Wooly, on Sally, on Ulysses, uh, the uh, black American veteran who's middle-aged, uh, on Aberne Abernathy, uh, Professor Abernathy, the old writer, that, how, that Billy's sort of view of the world reminds them all of certain things which they have forgotten, and so therefore uh, shapes them all in an important way. Yeah, in the, in, in the story of Ulysses, there's the Ulysses in the book yes. uh, who, who has his own Odyssean uh, uh, journey, journey uh, going, going on, and, and he encounters this author, who, young Billy, who has had no, you know, he's at the beginning of, of his journey, but he's read uh, Abernathy's books, and Abernathy's sitting in the Empire State Building uh, just being surrounded by books and, and, and writing books, uh, but then Ulysses comes into the midst of, this, midst of the story, and all of a sudden, everybody's on an odyssey. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so I, I, I told uh, Amor that I wanted to talk about his reading, because in The Lincoln Highway and, and the other books, there are lots and lots of references to books and authors. Emerson seems particularly yeah. important, and Thoreau. 
you know, they, they, they recur in the books. What, what, what inspired you to be a writer? Did we, are, are there other writers that inspired you to be a writer? Did you know this at an, at an early stage of life? I, d I did. I, 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 wanted, I decided I wanted to be a writer in first grade when I started reading. So, uh, and uh, we had just been learning how to read, <laughs> whatever. And uh, actually what happened, this is true, I, I was in first grade, Mrs. Gom, our, my, our teacher, invited a poet that, who was a friend of hers to come and read to us. He was a juvenile poet, meaning he wrote poet, uh, poetry for the young. And he was probably 60 years old, named David McCord. And he read his poems and he had his, you know, the books that we, we could buy his books after the class, you know, at the end of this day or whatever. And I just remember thinking, this is so cool. I mean, this is amazing, this guy and the poems. And, and so I went home and was very, I, you know, got some of his poetry and I was reading it. And then like within a day or two, I began trying to write poems like his poems. And that was it. You know, from that point on, it was kind of read, write, read, write, and repeat. And, uh, and my whole life has been like that ever since. Um, so it did, it, it was a, a the, write, reading and writing have always been, you know, like that for me, uh, bound. Now, I think one thing that's interesting in terms of the, so as a result, the history of literature is very interesting to me, and, uh, and it definitely infuses my work, and, you know, maybe, maybe I overdo that, <laughs> but, but uh, in, in the case of the Lincoln Highway, I think the, one of the interesting things about it uh, from, in this context is that, um, I, you know, some people say, oh, it's a road book. I really think of it as a journey novel. And the reason I make that, or a journey story, the reason I make that distinction is that if we look at Western culture, at least, uh, the journey narrative is one of the oldest and most important narratives in the Western tradition. And so if we go back to the beginning of the Western tradition, Greece, uh, classical Greece, uh, the, the peak of narrative writing in classical Greece is Homer's Odyssey when Ulysses, having won the Trojan War, is trying to get home to his kingdom, and it takes him 10 years to make the journey home. That is sort of the peak of writing in Greece. In the Roman Empire, the peak of narrative writing is the Aeneid, Virgil's epic, uh, which is Aeneas, having lost the Trojan War, having had his city destroyed, much of his uh, culture uh, destroyed, sets out on a journey to go find a new home for the last remaining members of his tribe, as it were. Um, but again, it's a journey story. In the beginning of English literature, you have Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, uh, with the pilgrims on their walk, trading uh, stories and observations. In uh, Spanish history, the beginning of, of serious narrative writing in Spain, and really many think it's the beginning of the novel, is Cervantes' Don Quixote, which is a journey story. And in, in English, in American English, excuse me, uh, right at the beginning, as the American vernacular is becoming a serious uh, language for literary writing, we begin with Melville writing Moby Dick, which is a journey story. You know, because as soon as uh, Ishmael gets on uh, the Pequot early in the book, uh, he never gets off again until the final page. So what is it about this? Why, why do writers throughout the Western tradition over centuries continue to return again and again to the journey story? And I think it's a pretty basic thing. I think it's what any of us would have, assume, which is that uh, n narrative writing is really about the transformation of individuals. It's about how an individual or a few individuals face obstacles, how they overcome those obstacles by making decisions and taking actions. Their actions then have repercussions, which then has an ethical component. And because of all this, they themselves undergo a transformation. This is at the heart of most storytelling, in one form or another. And so the journey was a very natural uh, story to take because it's sort of a metaphor for the whole internal transformation. We take that internal journey and then we stretch it out across space and we see the obstacles and we do the overcoming. And, and so it's sort of a natural thing to turn to. Now as the novel evolved, what ended up happening is that you get to like Jane, Henry James or Edith Wharton and it's still the same thing. It's just the journey is from like the bedroom to the parlor, you know? <laughs> That's the journey, you know? And there's as many like crises and monsters and you know, discoveries along that road as there would be for you know uh, uh, Ahab uh, crossing the ocean. So, it, 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 and I want to go, go back to Emerson to relate it to what you just said. One of his famous essays, of course, is Fate. And and your characters, some of your characters seem particularly Duchess and Woolley. I would I would say are fated or or tinker in uh, in rules of civility. There, 
their character becomes their fate, uh, and they can't, they can't overcome it. And uh, on the other hand, there are other characters who seem to be able to do that. Is that, is that the lesson that we're, uh, that, that we're meant to learn? Well, I think, I think wrestling, I'm not trying to teach, I'm not trying to give any lessons, but I am interested in describing the human experience. And, uh, and so I think that, that we all are wrestling to some degree with that dynamic. To what degree uh, are, we, are we stuck in a rut which defines how we're gonna end up? To what degree can we change things? Uh, to what degree are, are we suddenly, uh, are we fated? Do we feel that we're fated to end up in a certain way? You know, we're all wrestling with uh, where are we going? How, how successfully can we shape our own experience? How can we change the outcomes in our lives? And what are the forces that are kind of getting in the way of our efforts to do so? Do we have the wisdom to even make the right decisions to begin with? You know, these are things that we're all wrestling with. And so I, I think that uh, both in my writing, but I think in the novel in general, that, that tends and, to be a core topic. And so another, another notion that's, it, that's kind of in the middle of the, of the book, though it's, it, he starts out expressing it earlier on, is uh, Billy's been told uh, at some point, I guess by reading the, the, the book, that, that w we have to find the middle of the journey. We have to know the middle of the journey. And here's this eight-year-old kid who's wondering, how do I find the middle of the journey? And I wonder if in your life, having, there, having been a really major change, which you don't want to talk about, you told me, so we won't talk about it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 a huge change in the middle, in the middle of your life. Do you, it, it, are your characters experiencing the same thing? You experience this middle of the journey thing, Dante-esque, no mean. Uh, uh, <laughs> what he's talking about is I was in the investment business for 20 years. And so I, I wanted to be a writer as a kid. I, did the, I was in the investment business for 20 years. I wrote Rules of Civility while still in the job. And then when that book came out, I retired from the investment business and I've been a writer full time ever since. And I just said, I've talked about that before, I don't need to talk about that again. Um, so, so what, yeah, I didn't, want, I didn't want you to think that like some incredible thing had happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, 50, I'm 58 years old, so, so, so yeah, you know, midlife, or I'm past midlife. Uh, but but I, of course, you're, 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 as you age, you're, you're thinking about the world from your own angle and, uh, and so thinking about how do these different sort of moments of transformation occur in your life. And, um, you know, I feel very lucky to have had the transformation that I've had, yeah. And, and you know, another, another sense you get from the, the books is that our, pa our past is our fate, that the past is, is always with us. And each of these characters, again, Billy, even Billy has it in the sense that his fate is, is driven by this book he's read by the author. They ulti ultimately, instead of going to California, they go to an office, office building and, uh, called the Empire State Building. Um, and, and so fate in that sense plays a role. It, it's also interesting to me that your, the books are full of monuments and special places, the, the Statue of Liberty, Times Square, um, it, places that uh, to go to on the journey are, are really important icons, if you will. Um, is that, is that a, a, something you consciously do or these things have been important in your life? Yeah, I haven't really thought about that I, very much. I, I think uh, it is true when you're kind of imagining a story and you're going, I'm going through the design process and you're sort of asking yourself, where are they gonna end up? It, it's sort of natural to have sort of aspects of the, of in essence the national architecture start to appear as a part of the story. Because you're, you're again, it's a balanced dynamic. You know that a portion of the story is gonna be in a very intimate private space. In this case, they end up at this family home in the Adirondacks. And, which is sort of defined by a very particular family's tradition. And, it's, and as I say, it's very intimate in that way that a home can be with its own photographs and its own furniture and, and the own sort of tradition of the family visiting there. So you have that kind of thing, but then you sort of have, uh, but out there is the Empire State Building, right? And that even though most of us have never been in it, we all know what it is. And somehow it defines uh, a whole array of things for us. It defines New York City, yes, but it also defines sort of a sense of, of American aspiration. You know, it comes out of the, it's built in the depression, you know, around, just around that time. It sort of comes sort of, so it's out of that tradition. Um, and, and it's sort of beautiful architecturally. And then inside it are thousands of people doing thousand different jobs, all packed into that one building. So, 
as I say, you're, it's very natural, I think, as you're designing something is to sort of have this dynamic where you're, you're interested in comparing these different kinds of spaces, those which are national in shape and that have intricate built-in metaphors uh, against those which are going to be very private and no one would know what they look like until they're described for the reader for the first time. And, and so I get, I get a sense that get, getting outside of your own past into a larger past, the world's past, in, in whether it's Times Square, the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building, or, or going to Lincoln Park on the Lincoln Highway that, that Billy wants to do that sets them off on, on this journey, that, that, sort of, that sort of versus what uh, Woolley and, and the Duchess are involved in. Duchess has to take, he has, his journey has to go back to the, 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 uh, the orphanage. He has to go back to the past and somehow try to correct the past. Um, uh, and Woolley can never correct his past. Uh, there's a sense of he, he's the most faded character uh, in, in the book. So getting out of your past also seems to be a big part of the, the journey. Yeah, th that's true, and I, and I think that's, you know, we, we live in a, in a generation where a lot of young people grow up or, or, or move, right? You know, you think about for a thousand years, if you were born in a town, you probably stayed in that town, and you, you, you did what your father or mother did for a living, and you raised children among their cousins, and, and you stayed there. You, know, from, you were born there, you died there, and, and, and we've become a society where, uh, where we're very mobile, mobile. and uh, we, we have three children, and you're lucky if one stays in your state. You know? Two and co will drift out, and that's a wonderful thing, of course, about the, the, the modern era in many ways, as, as individuals kind of go out and, and uh, carve their own path. But it does create this sort of very interesting uh, uh, tension in modern life, which is, uh, I have the freedom to go out and start entirely fresh, um, but on the other hand, I have there's some strengths that I gain from my family and from my tradition, and, and do I put those at risk when I go out and forge my own path? Or for you have individuals who are like, get me out of here. You know, this is killing me, this, this town, or, this, or what my parents expect of me, or, or uh, the mores of, of where I was raised. And I, I want to go and, and, and do something different. And so both of these things are happening in modern American society, and and have you know, been dominating it, our, our lives for about 100 years. And that's, I find that very interesting topic as well. So y you have a child or children? I, I have a, a son uh, and daughter, both college age. And, and when, when, because the journey is so important in your books, and, and, and we've talked about the nature of that journey, do you think about your children when you're writing? Do you think about telling a story to them that tells them something about life? I never think about my children while I'm writing. I know, it's terrible, I know it's terrible, but that's true, it's true. You know, that, that's you know, part of the whole, part, part of the writing process, and I think this is true for many, is that you get lost in it, you know, and so you're, that's part of what happens, is it's, it's very, um, it's not a very friendly practice, you know, because <laughs> you're like, I don't, I'm not thinking about anybody or them, or the world, or readers, or commerce, or family, or anything, you get, the. At its best, you immerse yourself into the world that you're inventing, and that is, takes over 100% of your consciousness. And, and, uh, and that's when things are going well. And, uh, you know, I'm an outliner. I outline very, in great detail, before I write my books. I know everything that's going to happen, chapter by chapter, scene by scene, setting by setting. And there's a reason for that, and it's a little counterintuitive, so I'll share that. And, and the reason I'm such a serious outliner is because I'm particularly interested in how the imagination and the subconscious can infuse the language of my storytelling to make the work more rich. And the counterintuitive part here is that if I am about to write a chapter and I don't know what's going to happen, what's going to happen is, is that the, uh, the left side of my brain, which is the decision-making, problem-solving part of the brain, is going to have to take over. Because I'm going to have to sit there and figure out, okay, who's in the scene? Where are they from? What does the room look like? What happens next? Why does that happen? What do they mean by that? And, and it kind of dominates the writing process suddenly, that kind of thought process, which is not ideal from an artistic standpoint for me. So if I can figure all that out in advance, what that means is that when I go into the writing, I can allow my subconscious to take over. Since I know what's going to happen, I know what the room looks like, I know who the people are, then I can really just sort of follow where my whims are in terms of how I express the different moments. And 
I can allow the characters themselves to sort of come more to life. I can be surprised by what they do. I can be surprised by what they say. I can be surprised by the phrasing that suddenly presents itself into my, my imagination. And so I is, there is this counterintuitive dynamic, which is that I do the outlining in order to maximize the unexpected aspect of the, of the poetic process. And I do not think about my children while I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we, you know, we're down, believe it or not, we're down to like three or four minutes here. They really, this is like a train station, I know. I did want to share one thing with you uh, before we have to go. And, and uh, so, uh, and that is I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my, the role of history in my work, uh, you know, which is partly what I guess the headline is today, but, but more broadly, I think it's an interesting and important topic. And, and um, to make, to give you a sense of the role of history in my work, uh, I, I, an, a, an analogy is, is the best way, I think. So what I want you to imagine is that you're at a play. You're sitting in the audience at a theater. And let's say it's Chekhov, let's say it's the Cherry Orchard, which is gonna be performed. And you're sitting there in the audience. Now, when you look out from the audience across the stage, what you're seeing on the stage is the living room of a wealthy Russian estate. Nice furniture, you know, mahogany, et cetera. And at the back of the room are some French doors and through the French doors in the distance, you can actually see the cherry orchard, which is in bloom, because it's spring. And so you can see the white and pink petals in the distance. Now, when you're in a theater and you're looking across the stage and you see the cherry orchard through the French doors at the back of the stage, of course, what you are actually looking at is a painted canvas, right? Because that's the way we do it in the theater. Uh, we might have an actual French doors, but behind that, we're gonna drop a canvas which we've painted the cherry orchard uh, so that's what we're going to be witnessing. Now, when the team paints the cherry orchard so that you can see it, they're not going to paint it in a hyper-realistic style because that would look weird to the, to the eye. Instead, they'll use probably an impressionist style. They'll paint it as uh, Monet might have or Renoir uh, might, might have uh, in such that it's a little hazy. And by doing so, that looks natural because it's in the far distance, but also it gives that feeling of the afternoon light, we can almost see the petals on the trees moving in the, in the breeze um, because of that painting style. Now, in front of that, you have the French doors. On either side of the French doors on the stage, you have uh, mahogany book, or, uh, bookcases over here, which are painted, uh, built out of plywood and painted to look like mahogany, right? And over here, you have a stairwell, uh, stairway that goes nowhere, and over here, you've got a, a doorway that goes nowhere, right? That's a part of the set. But now in front of the stage is an actual table surrounded by actual chairs on which there is an actual China tea service. And it's very important that these things be actual. Because let's say the scene is uh, a young woman is sitting having tea by herself and her brother comes through the door and you can see that he's in high emotion. And when he sits with his sister intending to speak with her, we want to hear the him dragging, pulling back the chair, the legs, the wooden legs scraping across the wooden surface of the stage, and as he pulls himself up, and when he starts to describe what he's thinking uh, and is sharing his opinions with his sister, and he smacks, you know, the table with his palm for emphasis, we want to hear the physicality of that palm hitting the wood of the table. And the sister, when she has been listening very patiently to her brother, when she sets down her teacup before responding, we want to hear that delicate clink of the china cup on the china saucer, which is almost an expression of her patience with her brother. Right? This, is, this is all very important to the theatricality of the stage, to bring the scene to life for us as members of the audience. Now, this is exactly the way that my work is layered and constructed. History for me is the painted backdrop. It's way back there. Uh, it is not painted in a realistic style. It's painted in an impressionist style. Because it's only there, history's only there to give you a sense of mood, a sense of time, a sense of place, but really that's it. Now in front of that in my work is a lot of mahogany painted, sorry, a lot of plywood painted to look like mahogany. You know, it's stuff where, where you read it, you can't tell, is this thing real or is this fake? You can't quite tell. 
You know, and, and, and I love that. That's a great thing that in my work that you might have that moment where you're not sure. Okay. But in front of all that is the table and chairs. And that has to feel very real to you. I want it to feel very real to you, so real, that as the brother and sister to begin to talk, I want you to feel like you are sitting at that table, that you are close enough and attentive enough that you can hear the slight variations in their tone of voice, and you can see the slight shifts in the expression of their faces as they exchange their sentiments and their ideas. And I want that to be very real to you because that's where the action is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.